from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Phantom Clock of Portman Square The idea that hauntings are invariably due to troubled and unhappy spirits of the dead ever seeking the prayers and consolations of the living is, of course as any genuine psychic researcher knows, entirely erroneous. In many cases of hauntings, perhaps even in the majority, the nature of the phenomena suggests they are due to some species of spirit that has never inhabited a human body, and one which, far from pining for the society of mankind, desires nothing better than to be left rigorously alone. Such spirits are, as a rule, entirely antagonistic to all human beings. An example of this is the haunting of a house in Upper Gloucester Place, Portman Square in the heart of London. A few years prior to World War I, the house, which had stood empty for some time, was taken by Mr. and Mrs. Strawn. One night, Mrs. Strawn could not try as she would go to sleep. She was reviewing in her mind, probably for the umpteenth time, the incidents of the day, and planning and arranging certain little jobs for the morrow, when she suddenly became conscious of an extraordinary stillness. It seemed forced and unnatural, the prelude, in fact, to something which her instinct told her would be alarmingly unpleasant. A few minutes later, when her suspense had become well-nigh unbearable, the hush was abruptly broken by the sonorous striking of a grandfather clock, the sounds apparently coming from the landing close to their bedroom door. But the Strons had no such clock in their possession. Although almost fainting with fright, Mrs. Strawn felt constrained to count the strokes, one, two, three, on and on it went till it struck twelve, and then, to Mrs. Strawn's astonishment, it struck once more, thirteen. After that, there was a short interval, and then, once again, the clock commenced striking, and this time very slowly and with a curiously menacing intonation, it struck five. There then followed a heavy silence, which was eventually broken by Mr. Strong whispering, Did you hear that? My dear, I wonder what it means. They were, of course, unable to say then, but Mrs. Strong knew soon enough, for exactly five days later her husband met with a fatal accident while roller skating at a rink in London. After such an experience, one might have thought that the first thing the widow would do would be to vacate the house, but for some strange reason she stayed, and for several years she was in no way disturbed. Then suddenly all kinds of queer noises such as knockings on the walls and doors and crashes as of cartloads of crockery being dashed on the floor from a great height were heard in the house. The noises, commencing as a rule at about midnight and lasting till two o'clock, continued night after night. Mrs. Strawn, acting upon the advice of a friend, called in a medium who, after staying in the house only a few minutes, took her departure declaring she had seen and conversed with the spirit of a former occupant and that there would be no more disturbances in consequence. The disturbances continuing, however, Mrs. Strawn called in another medium, but the result was the same, and although the spirit who was responsible, a different spirit this time, by the way, was again said to be laid, there was no abatement of the trouble. It was not until these futile attempts at exorcism had taken place that Mrs. Strawn thought of communicating with me. I then went to see her, and after hearing her story of the clock and other phenomena she had experienced, I told her that, in my opinion, the influence at work emanated from some spirit that wanted her out of the house, a spirit that was inimical, if not actually evil. I also told her that it was, in all probability, an elemental, elementals being quite distinct and apart from the earthbound spirits of the dead. Even as I spoke, 
a feeling that it would be dangerous for her to remain in the house any longer came over me so strongly that I urged her to leave the place without delay. I did not see her after that for several weeks, and then, quite by chance, I found myself sitting next to her at a theater performance. Well, I said, have you left the house? No, she replied. Somehow I couldn't tear myself away. And do you know, I heard that phantom clock again last night. It struck thirteen, first of all, just as before, and then very slowly it struck three. I have a relative who is very ill, and I cannot help feeling that it predicts death. What do you think? I could not say what I thought, for while she was telling me of the incident, I had a strong presentiment that the ghostly clock had foretold her own death. I again urged her to leave the house at once. Two days later, that is to say on the morning of the third day, after hearing the phantom clock striking, she was killed in a taxi cab collision in Portman Square, the piece of glass that was the instrument of her death. It severed the jugular vein, and she died in exactly three minutes from the time she was struck, came from the window that was furthest from her, while the woman, an intimate friend who was with her and sat next to the window, was untouched, as also was a small dog that had sat on Mrs. Strong's lap. I heard nothing more of the Upper Gloucester place for about a year. I then met a man at a friend's house one afternoon, who, happening to hear me tell a friend about Mrs. Strawn and the phantom clock, remarked, Oh, I know that house well. It has been haunted, so I have heard for a very long time now, and apparently by a variety of ghosts, as your clock ghost is quite new to me. He then told us the following story. About thirty years ago, an uncle of mine, hearing that the house was to be let at a very small rental, applied for it to the agent. I think I ought to tell you, the agent observed, after my uncle had announced his desire to take it, that the house bears a reputation for being haunted. Indeed, that is why we are offering it as such a low figure. Oh, that won't worry me, my uncle laughed, for I don't believe in ghosts. They are all bunkum. But tell me, has the house a history? I mean, has anything happened there for, although I don't care two raps about ghosts, I do not altogether relish the idea of living in a house where notorious murder has been committed. The agent smiled. You can make your mind quite easy on that point, he said. There has been no murder in it, and as far as I am aware, not even a suicide, though what may have happened on the side of the house before it was built, I cannot, of course, say. The haunting is, I understand, confined to one room, the large back bedroom on the second floor, and I should advise you to convert it into a storeroom. My uncle laughed again. Why, what nonsense, he exclaimed. I will sleep in it myself. Finally, my uncle took the house and within a few days moved into it. He was absolutely well at the time. Three months later, he called to see me one morning and I was appalled at the change in him. He must have lost a stone in weight and instead of having a healthy complexion, he had no color at all. His face was all white and drawn and haggard. He had, in fact, altered to such an extent that I hardly knew him. Why, uncle, I exclaimed, after I had helped him off with his coat and handed him one of the brand of cigars I kept especially for him. How ill you look. What's wrong with you? Everything, my uncle groaned. You won't believe me, perhaps, when I tell you, my boy, but I'm lost. Lost body and soul. You can't conceive a more hideous fate. He spoke so despairingly that I looked at him in amazement. Was it possible, I wondered, that he had become deranged since last I saw him? No, he replied, interpreting my thoughts. I'm not mad, Jack. I wish I were. I'm horribly sane. You haven't seen me since I took up my house in Upper Gloucester Place, have you? I shook my head. I thought not, he went on. Well... You may recollect my telling you that the ancient said the house was haunted and strongly advised me not to sleep in a certain room. Well, like the fool I was, I only laughed at him and slept in the room he warmed me against. For exactly a week, nothing happened. And then one night, I had an experience so hideous that I have never been able to dismiss it from my mind. Not for a day or an hour, even a minute. Listen. Shortly after I got into bed, I fell asleep and had the most singular dream. I thought as I was lying there in the bed 
that the door of my room suddenly opened and a man in evening clothes with a very white face looked in at me and whispered, Come. Well, I got up, frightened though I was, for there was something about the man that was undoubtedly terrifying. I nevertheless felt constrained to obey and followed him. Down the staircase he led me to the cellar under the pavement, where to my astonishment I saw a flight of stone steps going right down, down into apparently the bowels of the earth. I shrank back in horror, whereupon my guide turned round and once again whispered, Come! And as before I was compelled to follow, he took me down countless steps till we finally arrived at a stone passage along which we went till we suddenly found ourselves in a vast vaulted chamber. The center of the floor was occupied by a long table, at which were seated a number of men and women, all with faces the same startling white as my guide. On my entrance, a man, sitting at the end of the table, nearest the passage, looked round and motioned to me to be seated, and though I would have given anything to retreat, I again found it impossible to do so other than obey. When I had taken my place near him, I looked round at the company, who were conversing together in semi-whispers, and was at once struck by the mingled expression of furtive fear and utter hopelessness in their face. They seemed to be in a constant state of terror, of terror at each other, at their surroundings, and over and above all, at the form seated at the end of the table, that I had at first taken to be a man, but which now seemed to me to be a strange and horrid cross between a human being and some particularly grotesque kind of animal. The horror with which the whole scene inspired me at length became so unbearable that, unable to endure it any longer, I sprang up and was on the point of rushing out of the chamber when a woman, seated at my side, caught hold of me and with the most surprising strength pulled me back. It's no use, she laughed. You can't get away. We are all of us here for eternity. For the love of God, let me go, I cried, turning to the things seated at the end of the table. I haven't done anything. Oh, yes, you have, was the reply, uttered in a strangely far away and hollow voice. You have slept in the room you knew we haunted, and everyone who sleeps in that room is bound to come here sooner or later. Mr. Robert Percival slept there, and he is here now. So are Miss Sarah Hackett, Mrs. Emma Freeman, Colonel William Sackerell, and others. They all slept in that room, and were drawn here by our atmosphere, which in a similar fashion drew you. We will let you go now, however, on one condition and that is you promise you will return here some time or other on June 21st. Well, my uncle said with a groan, I promised, and no sooner had I done so than everything became a blank, and I woke to find myself in bed. It was nothing more than a dream, uncle, I reassured him. Wait, my uncle said. It had all been so hideously vivid that I made inquiries and finally elicited the fact that a Mrs. Emma Freeman, a Miss Sarah Hackett, and a Colonel Sackrell had actually lived in this house and died there. So you see, I am lost. I have promised those fiends that I will return to them on June 21st, and if I don't go of my own accord, they will find a means of making me. I tried to laugh him out of it, but it was of no use, and finally I suggested he should leave the house and go abroad for a change. He wouldn't agree, however. The house seemed to have some extraordinary fascination for him. I have subsequently discovered it has for everyone who once stays there, and he remained. I called to see him on the afternoon of June 21st. He was apparently well then, though terribly nervous and restless. When I called again the following morning, he was dead. He had died, so the doctor said in his sleep, from heart failure. A Haunted Hampstead House Had I not known a friend of an intimate friend of the senior partner of a firm of estate agents in Haverstock Hill, I feel pretty certain I could never have obtained the keys of a house on Churchwalk Hampstead for the purpose of conducting there a midnight vigil. As it was, I had some difficulty since, according to the rules of the firm, the keys of all the houses on their list had to be returned to the office before it was closed for the night, and I, of course, 
wanted to keep them overnight in order to watch for the ghost which was reputed to haunt the place. I had heard on pretty reliable evidence that the house in question was one of the worst haunted houses in London. I chose a night in September for my investigation because, in my experience, ghostly demonstrations occur more often in this month than any other. I had no idea what form the manifestations took, whether they were merely auditory or visual or both. All I knew about them was that they were reputed to be most alarming. I arrived there alone about 11 o'clock. In most empty and long deserted houses there is a feeling of loneliness, and certainly in this house there was a feeling of intense loneliness. I was conscious of it directly across the threshold, and I was conscious also of a sensation of acute depression. The thoughts and emotions poignant enough to permeate the atmosphere linger, to influence and affect certain supersensitive minds is, I think, now recognized by most serious students of psychic search. How someone must have suffered was my first thought on entering, and hardly had I conceived it when from close beside me came a curious sound, half a sigh and half a shudder. With the aid of my torch, I looked sharply around. No one was there. I examined the rooms on the ground floor and basement, and everywhere I went, I had the uncomfortable feeling of being followed and closely watched. It was when I finished examining the kitchen and was in the hall that I first heard footsteps, distinct pattering footsteps, that at once conjured up mental visions of a child. They came down the stairs towards me, halted, and then abruptly retreated, as if panicked. As I went up the stairs after them, I again heard that queer, shuddering sigh, this time just in front of me. Having gone into all the rooms, I decided to hold my vigil on the staircase, leading from the top landing to the floor immediately beneath it. A staircase is often the most haunted place in a house, and I instinctively felt it was so in this house. Again and again, as I sat there in the dark, listening and watching, I heard the stairs below me creak, as if someone was creeping very stealthily and surreptitiously up them. And several times I heard that harrowing half shudder, half sigh, but I saw nothing. About three o'clock, tired of sitting on the hard stairs for so long, I got up and was crossing the landing beneath when I bumped into someone or something. I flashed my torch. No one, nothing was to be seen. But as I stood there staring around, my eyes became focused on the handle of a door facing me. It was a door of a room I had been into, and I remembered closing it after I left it. It was still closed, but the handle was turning and presently the door very slowly commenced opening. It took a very great effort on my part to go to the door, throw it wide open, and look into the room. No one was there, but as my light played over the bare boards and walls, I very distinctly heard a door on the other side of the landing gently open and as gently close. Someone or something was undoubtedly moving about. Startled by this realization, I let my torch fall. As I was stooping to pick it up, it was thrust into my hand. That such an apparently considerate and, on the face of it, ordinary act should have produced a paralyzing effect on me may seem to some people extraordinary, but I can only say it did, and that for some moments I was utterly demoralized. But eventually I recovered sufficiently to switch on my light. To my relief, I saw nothing. I was seemingly alone, and yet I had a very uncomfortable feeling that a presence of none too pleasant a nature was standing close beside me. I spent what remained of the night on the staircase leading from the first story to the ground floor. The darkness of the night had for some time given way to the gray early morning when the front door opened and a red-haired woman carrying a carpet bag in one hand entered. I wasn't sorry to see that charwoman. She made me realize that the horrors of the night were at last over. It was futile to remain there any longer, so I came away. And you actually saw nothing, my friend remarked, when I narrated my experience to him. Nothing, I replied, and I stayed there till the charwoman or caretaker arrived in the morning. Char or caretaker, he said, with growing interest. What was she like? I told him. Why, my good man, was his answer. 
then you did see something after all. That was the ghost. He went on to tell me that according to rumor, many years before red-haired woman had murdered and dismembered a child in the house and carried away the remains in a carpet bag. The Haunted Quarry I had never been in Galway till I went on a visit to my friends, the Dillons. They were having a housewarming, having only just come to the house, Ballybrig Castle. The castle was really a castellated house, quite new. Indeed, the Dillons were the first occupants. It was built on virgin soil, no other house nearer to it than a mile. Fronting it was a newly fashioned terrace lawn, and beyond that a ragged field with sparse trees, a hillock, and a quarry, and the rear of the house was a yard enclosed with high walls and a pool said to be fathomless. The Dillon family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Dillon, three girls, Nora, Sally, and Deidre, and two sons, Daniel, an architect, and Christopher, a sailor in the Royal Navy. He was home on leave. I had the feeling that there was something very queer about the house the first night I was in it, something I had never experienced before, too suddenly unusual to explain. Tired after a long journey, I went to bed earlier than usual and soon fell asleep. Something woke me sharply. And I had a feeling that something startling was about to happen. The window magnetized me. I got up and went to it. The night was fine and very still. Every object in the landscape stood out very clearly. A big dark Galway hare scurried across the ground and a night bird hooted dismally. Looking in the direction of the quarry, I saw a misty shape emerge from it and come slowly towards the house. It was tall and gave me the impression of something human in form, but with unusually long spidery arms and legs and a rotund head, something not unlike a giant Dutch doll. It came striding along in the moonlight, its arms hanging loosely by its side. Fascinated, I watched it drawing nearer and nearer till it reached the house. When it swerved, swung round, and strode in the direction of the yard and stabling. The house dogs whined and growled for a few seconds and were then silent. I sensed that they were very frightened. I could not drag myself away from the window for some time. Eventually, I released myself from the magnetic chain that bound me and went back to bed. I did not say anything about my experience to the Dillons. The following morning, Nora came down to breakfast looking pale and as if she had not had a good night. She then told us that she had a very jarring experience. It was similar to mine. Deidre was the next to have a queer experience. She was on the lawn, throwing a ball to pickle one of the dogs. She threw it further than she intended, and it went into a bush. She told Pickle to go after it, but on getting near the bush, he stopped, his hair bristled, and he whined and growled. Deidre looked behind the bush. There was a whizzing sound. The ball was thrown back over the bush, but she could not see who or what threw it. It left her somewhat disturbingly thrilled. Then Sally, while standing on the hillock one morning, felt a hand clutch hold of her ankle and deliberately try to trip her. She screamed and the hand let her go. It was a big bony hand with long fingers. Without daring to look round, she ran to the house. The boys now regarded the haunting seriously. Daniel had a friend, Herbert Ranger, who was a member of a psychic research society, and he invited him to the castle. Ranger came and listened very attentively to the accounts of the haunting, including mine. I don't know what I can do, he said. I'm just a researcher and more or less a skeptic. I can't exclude the possibility of it being a case of nerves and imagination with Nora. She saw what she thinks is a ghost. Fear is infectious, and Sally and Deidre and you, Mr. O'Donnell, fancy you saw a ghost too. It was no fancy, Sally said. Had I not screamed, I should have fallen. Mr. O'Donnell is not neurotic. He saw the ghost. Ranger smiled. He thought he did. I will have a look at the quarry, as it is from there your ghost apparently comes. After supper... He sat talking till after eleven and then set off alone to the quarry. I hope to goodness he will see the ghost, Sally said, and be damn well scared. It will take a lot to scare Herbert, Daniel laughed. He is very tough. Just the sort to get scared, Christopher said. I know the type. Cocksure and supercilious. 
We all waited anxiously for Ranger's return. At last he came. Did you see anything? We cried. I saw something, he said. What? I imagine it is what Taylor, the authority on nature spirits, calls an elemental. He believes that everything has a spirit, trees, stones, rocks, and they live harnessed to the things to which they are so closely allied till something happens to detach them. In this case, it was the making of the quarry. When that was affected, a nature spirit became loose and wandered abroad. Such nature spirits are harmless, or the reverse. In this case, it is the reverse. And I strongly advise you to have the quarry filled in or sell your house. To fill it in would be a hard job, Christopher said. I don't think so, Daniel said. The Galway Corporation might be glad to have an additional place to pitch their rubbish. I'll get in touch with them. He did, and the quarry was gradually filled in. When the filling was completed, the quarry was not so very deep. The haunting of Ballybrig Castle ceased. The Spectres of the Gables From time to time I have come in contact with what I have believed to be entities from another world. One such occasion happened when I was living in a village in the Midlands. There was a man named William Roberts who was a builder. He was a widower and lived alone in a cottage. There was rather a mystery regarding the death of his wife who was drowned in a pond. In appearance, William Roberts was far from prepossessing. He was about five feet eight inches in height, stocky and hunched back. He had a large head, big mouth-shaped ears, very light blue eyes under shaggy eyebrows, and a blotchy complexion. The ground on which he lived belonged to a Mr. Reginald Cliff, who occupied the Gables, a picturesque house about 200 yards from Robert's cottage. The Gables was at one time a small house. Robert's had lived in it, and without the permission of Mr. Cliff, who was the landlord, had added to it, and for that reason he actually had the audacity to think the Gables belonged to him. Mr. Cliff naturally opposed any such claim, had him ejected, and lived in the gables himself. He kindly permitted Roberts to rent the cottage near him. Roberts nourished a bitter animosity against Mr. Cliff for denying his right to the gables. I never liked Roberts and always tried to avoid him out of doors. On one occasion, however, I was obliged to meet him. He at once started his usual harangue against Mr. Cliff and said that when he died he would haunt the gables and drive Mr. Cliff and his family out of it. I was shocked at the venom in his voice and the malign glitter in his light eyes. He had a stroke soon after my encounter with him and died from the effects of it. Shortly after his death, I left the village and returned to London. A year or so later, the Cliffs asked me to spend a weekend with them. The night of my arrival at the Gables, I occupied a room at the end of a corridor on the first floor. Tired from my journey and much walking before I embarked on it, I fell asleep almost before I was between the sheets. I awoke with a start and a feeling that something was about to happen. Fancying I heard a sound close to me, I sat up. It was a fine night. I had not drawn the curtains as it was very warm, and the moonlight flooding the room rendered every article in it clearly visible. There was nothing to account for the noise. I was still glancing around when two figures, those of a man and a woman, emerged from one of the walls. Their white faces showed no animation. They were those of the dead. In spite of his dreadful corpse-like appearance, I recognized the male apparition at once. It was William Roberts. The female phantom did not resemble Mrs. Roberts nor anyone I had ever seen. In the course of very many nocturnal vigils and houses and places reputed to be haunted, sometimes alone and sometimes with other people, I have been badly jarred but seldom if ever more so than on this occasion. There was something so indescribably evil and sinister about the figures, and when they came towards me, I scrambled out of bed and onto the landing. However, I quickly pulled myself together and went back to the room. To my great relief, the apparitions had gone, and there was nothing more ghostly than the white pillows gleaming in the moonlight. In the morning, I related my experience to the cliffs, who said they had frequently been disturbed by noises at night, but had never seen anything. When the Roberts lived in the house, there had always been one large room at the end of the corridor. After they left, Mr. Cliff had made a partition in the room 
dividing it into two, a fact of which I was unaware. This, the cliffs thought, might account for the apparition seeming to emerge from the wall, which actually was the partition. Contrary to their wish, I slept another night in the same room, but did not see the ghosts again. William Roberts failed in his design to drive the cliffs from the gables, for they lived in it for many years, long after the ghostly disturbances ceased. The Nun of Digby Court Ralph Marlowe received a letter one morning in December 1820 from his friend Dick Holloway. Dear Ralph, Holloway wrote, if you are not fixed for Christmas, stay with me at Digby Court in Warwickshire. I have inherited a house and lands from my great uncle, Sir Arthur Holloway, but I have never been there. Do come. As it happened, Marlowe had not fixed on anywhere to spend Christmas, so he was glad to accept the invitation. He and Holloway were old Harrow boys and had shared the same study there. He packed his portmanteau and took a hackney coach to the Peacock Inn at St. Pancras, where he got a seat in the stagecoach for Warwick. On arriving at Warwick, he found a carriage waiting for him and was driven to Digby Court. A drive through an avenue of stately old trees led to the house, a long building of two stories at each end of which was a gabled tower covered with ivy. Fronting the house was an extensive lawn, and at the end of this a lake bordered by trees and bushes. On entering the house, Marla was led by Mrs. Hay, the elderly caretaker, across a wide hall overlooked by a gallery connecting the east and west wings. A broad oak staircase led from the hall to the gallery. A good supper was laid for him in the dining room, the walls of which were adorned with portraits of the Holloways. Marlowe did full justice to it, for the drive along the frost-laden high road had made him very hungry. Mrs. Hay asked if there was anything she could do for him before he went to bed and then left the house. She lived at the park lodge and seemed in a hurry to get back to it. Holloway was not to come till the next day. Marlowe sat before the cheerful wood fire in the dining room for some time before he went to bed. He then experienced his first shock. As he was ascending the staircase to his room, a figure covered with what looked like wool rushed past him, leaving behind it a dreadful smell like that of a charnel house. What the figure was, whether male or female or anything at all human, he could not tell. And it was only with a desperate effort that he recovered from the fright that the thing gave him and continued to ascend the stairs. His room was in a quarter in the east wing and where he found a bright fire in the wide old world grate. He locked the door, sat before the fire for some minutes and then got into bed, sleeping till Mrs. Hay brought him a cup of tea in the morning. He did not mention his experience to her. Holloway and a party of people with servants and luggage arrived at noon. A more merry party had seldom have ever sat down to lunch. They then spent the afternoon wandering about the house and grounds. Marlowe, Holloway, and some of the guests were approaching the lake along a path flanked on either side by bushes when a woman in the garb of a nun passed quickly by them. A nun, Holloway exclaimed. How did she get here? I wonder. There is no convent near here. They watched a receding form till it vanished round the bend in the path. When they returned to the house, Mrs. Hay was still there, and Holloway asked the caretaker who the nun was. Looking very taken aback and nervous, she said, I don't know, sir. I have never seen a nun here. After supper and coffee in the drawing room, the women chatted for a while and then went to bed. When they had gone, the men sat in the big hall, smoking and drinking. It was close on twelve o'clock when one of them uttered an exclamation of surprise and pointed to the gallery. Standing in it were three people, two men and a woman. They appeared to be talking but made no sound. Suddenly a nun rushed into the gallery and falling on her knees in front of the trio raised her hands in a supplicating gesture. Her face was that of a long buried corpse and a ghastly stench accompanied her. Appalled by her appearance and the smell of the men in the hall, stared in spellbound silence at the gallery. They did not speak or stir until as suddenly as they had appeared the phantom figures vanished. My God! Horrible! Ghastly! What, what does it mean? Don't tell the ladies, were the exclamations that succeeded the disappearance of the apparitions. I'm dashed if I know what it means, Holloway said. 
I had no idea this place was haunted. My great uncle never complained of ghosts. They kept very near one another when they went to bed. In the morning, two of the women declared that nothing would induce them to stay another hour in the house. They had been visited by a dreadful figure covered with wool and smelling horribly in the night and had been obliged to sit huddled close together in the corridor for a time. Their departure saw the departure of all the women and some of the men. Those that remained out of bravado saw the same phantoms again that night. All the servants, having panicked and left, Holloway, Marlowe, and the other men who had stayed left too, and Digby Court was abandoned to cobwebs, stillness, and ghosts.